How things begin are not nearly as important as how they end. Ten years ago this week, Bioware released the third and final game in the original Mass Effect trilogy. When you ask any gamer about Mass Effect 3, you're inevitably going to hear some variation of the following sentence. The ending was bad. It's unfortunate that all these years later, Mass Effect 3 is largely remembered for its poorly executed endings, which outshines all of the other great moments and some not so great moments in the game. In this video, we're going to take an in-depth look at Mass Effect 3 with a strong focus on its story, choices, and consequences. Keep watching to see it all. What's up everyone, Big Dan here. Before we begin, you should know I have over 150 Mass Effect trilogy videos on my channel, including hidden scenes, rare choices, lore videos, and guides. So if you want to see more Mass Effect, hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss any new videos. Without further ado, let's dive right in. Following the massive success of Dragon Age Origins and Mass Effect 2, EA sought to capitalize off the growing popularity of Bioware's single-player RPGs and find new ways to extract as much money as possible out of them. This led to aggressive publishing deadlines for Dragon Age 2, which the studio scrambled to develop and release in just over a year, among other games. Mass Effect 3 was developed in this atmosphere of bigger and faster releases. EA wanted to release the game in holiday season 2011, but the game was eventually delayed until spring 2012. This gave Bioware just over two years to develop the largest Mass Effect game to date. Here are all the things Bioware needed to accomplish for Mass Effect 3. Wrap up story arcs for 19 different squad mates, 15 of which could potentially die in one of the first two games. Close out major plot points like the geth Corian conflict, the Krogan Genophage, the Rachni Queen, Cerberus, the Prothean Extinction, and many more. Account for a wide array of choices that the players made in the first two games, while also presenting new choices. Create over a dozen different romance arcs. Incorporate lots of different minor NPCs from the first two games like Arya Talok, Bailey, Anderson, Hackett, Liara's dad, Barla Vaughn, Kelly Chambers, Conrad Werner, etc. Make the game accessible enough from a story standpoint for new players to jump in, even if they hadn't played Mass Effect 1 or Mass Effect 2. Overhaul the gameplay and combat system. Build an entirely new online multiplayer system, which Bioware had never done before in this franchise. And oh yeah, the Reapers. With such a gargantuan task, it's astonishing that Bioware was able to release a game that ran relatively bug-free and satisfied most of the points on the above list. It's a testament to the talent, dedication, hard work, and sacrifice that many developers contributed to the project during those years. The culture of crunch at Bioware eventually took its toll on the employees, leading to a major staff turnover in the years following Mass Effect 3 and Dragon Age Inquisition. But that's a topic for another day. On March 6, 2012, Mass Effect 3 finally released to much critical acclaim. However, all the positive things that gamers and critics had to say about the game were quickly overshadowed by the game's controversial ending, which left many of us unsatisfied. A lot of players felt like their previous choices weren't given proper branching paths, and so they left the experience feeling like their choices didn't really matter that much in the end. This last point of criticism has never really sat well with me, given the vast amount of unique dialogue and alternate outcomes you can experience in this game. Nonetheless, it is a sentiment that many players share, so I think it's worth exploring here. When it comes to choices and consequences, Mass Effect 3 is held to a standard that literally no game in the genre has ever achieved. This is partly Bioware's fault for setting up players to expect that many of their decisions would create a massive butterfly effect of branching paths, and that each player would have a wholly unique experience across these games. There are plenty of RPGs that grant the player ample story choices, but almost none track choices made in previous games in the series. For instance, Fallout and Elder Scrolls all start in a different place with a different character. None of the choices you make in Fallout 1 have any impact at all in Fallout 2. Similarly, anything you do in Oblivion has zero impact on Skyrim. Mass Effect 3 accounts for choices that you made in two previous games. This is incredibly unique and ambitious. The only other titles I can think of that attempt anything similar are the Dragon Age and Witcher games. But neither of those franchises account for choices on anything even close to the level of Mass Effect 3. In both Dragon Age and The Witcher, each game has a self-contained storyline that bears little impact on subsequent games. 
So while certain choices might come up in conversation, almost nothing ever has an actual impact on story outcomes. And in Dragon Age in particular, some past story choices are negated or simply hand-waved away. For instance, if you poison the Urn of Sacred Ashes and kill Liliana during Dragon Age Origins, she magically comes back to life in Dragon Age 2 and Inquisition. This is one of many examples of NPCs rising from the dead in Dragon Age. Compare this to the geth Corian conflict in Mass Effect 3, which weighs a variety of decisions you make in the second and third games to determine whether peace is an available option. Or Priority the Citadel 2, where decisions are weighed from all three games to determine whether or not the Vermeer survivor sides with Shepard or Udina. Or take any of the characters who replace squadmates that died in the suicide mission in Mass Effect 2. This kind of stuff just doesn't happen in any other franchise. And yet, it's still not enough for many players because they've come to expect so much more out of Bioware. Mass Effect 3 is held to a standard or an ideal that simply no game has ever reached. Mass Effect 3 opens up with Shepard in quiet contemplation. All these years and these poor bastards still won't listen to me. They don't have a clue what's coming to them. The Reapers. So what if I incinerated 300,000 Batarians? You all should be thanking me. Stop them? We're fighting skyscraper-sized AI death robots for Christ's sake. Move, move, move! In the first few moments of the game, the Reapers invade Canada. Starting Mass Effect 3 on Earth was the right choice for this game for a few reasons. First, it's easy to identify with and connect with because we, the players, live on this planet. It also gives us a strong symbol throughout the game of what we're fighting for. And it captures the whole, it ends where it all began vibe. It is kind of funny that the game starts out in Vancouver, though. Bioware is delusional if they think the center of humanity's military operations are going to be run by Canadians. You know what I'm saying? Anyhow, after experiencing the Reaper invasion and tutorial sections of the game, Joker swoops down into Normandy like a badass, while Anderson is like, Consider yourself reinstated, Commander! And he tells Shepard to go build alliances to help defeat the Reapers on Earth. Back on the ship, James is like, We're leaving Earth? This is loco! And we get our first Paragon interrupt of the game. Admiral Hackett Zoom calls us with his shitty dial-up internet connection and tells us we need to make a pit stop to the Mars Archives, where our blue baddie Liara Tassoni has located blueprints for an ancient Prothean Reaper killer device. We land on Mars only to find that our old pals in Cerberus are working for the Reapers. The Vermeer survivor still doesn't trust us and suspects we may know something about their plans. How we treat Ashley or Caden in these conversations can potentially have an impact later in the game. There is a hidden trust meter with this character that will determine how they will behave towards Shepard, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We link up with Liara, talk to the elusive man, grab as much Prothean data as we can before having the most scripted chase scene of this entire franchise. You cannot damage Dr. Ava enough to kill her, so it's not worth trying. Just run up until you trigger the cutscene where James crashes the shuttle into her. Then she'll bash up the Vermeer survivor before going out in a blaze of glory. I don't like on-rails gameplay segments like this, especially in an RPG. Unbeatable bosses, unwinnable chase sequences, that sort of thing. But I've played through this section so many times at this point that I've just accepted it for what it is. They wanted to set up James's reckless behavior, the Vermeer survivor being separated from Shepard, and Edie's new body, and they accomplished all of that. We make a stopover at the Citadel, tell Ashley, we'll bang, okay? And surprise, surprise, the Council still will not help us. Udina is particularly hilarious during this part. They're a bunch of self-concerned jackasses, Shepard. The Council. You saved their lives. And for what? The Turian Counselor is ready to make a deal, save their Primarch in exchange for potential support at an upcoming war summit. It's not much, but it gives us something to start working on. I don't have a whole lot to say about the Palavan mission. It's a good linear mission that introduces some new enemy types and gives us some added lore that is helpful for new players. We also reunite with our best bro, Garrus. More than anything, Palavin is a reminder of all that's at stake. The Turians have the strongest military in the galaxy, and their planet has been decimated in a matter of a few days. It shows what will happen to Earth and every other planet if we cannot unite the galaxy to fight back against the Reapers. After Palavin, it's a good time to take a beat and visit some old friends on the Citadel, including Miranda, Thane, Kasumi, and Kelly Chambers. The Vermeer survivor will be awake by now, giving you a chance to talk, and you'll get a series of side quests from Arya Talok. 
You can also reunite Liara with her father in the early game, which leads to some great conversations. The Citadel will be your primary hub to progress companion conversations, reconnect with former squadmates, and pick up major side quests. So I recommend stopping here at every opportunity to see what you've missed. Now is as good a time as any to mention the War Asset System and how Mass Effect 3 multiplayer fit into it. As you progress throughout the game and recruit allies, they will be added to your War Asset Terminal on the Normandy. Each ally you gain has a War Asset score, and your total score influences what happens during the ending, such as what ending choices are available to you, what happens to Earth, whether your squad mates survive the dash to the Citadel Beam, whether the Normandy survives the Crucible detonation, and whether Shepard survives in the Destroy ending. In the original version of the game, there were two War Asset scores, Total Military Strength and Effective Military Strength. If you only played the single player campaign, then your effective military strength would be cut in half. The only way to increase that score was to play the multiplayer mode, which would boost your galactic readiness rating and give you a higher effective military strength. If you wanted to achieve the best version of the destroy ending, where Shepard survives, it was almost impossible to get this ending without playing multiplayer. You essentially needed to make every correct choice in the game and play all of the DLC to have enough effective military strength to unlock this ending. I shouldn't have to spell out why this is frustrating, but I will. To this day, this is the only game I've played where the multiplayer mode affects the ending of the single player campaign. I hated this design choice, especially since by the time I played Mass Effect 3, it wasn't as easy to jump into a multiplayer match depending on what time of day you were playing. Mass Effect 3 multiplayer is still active today, and some people really like it. But I still don't think it should have had an impact on your war asset scores in single player mode. In Mass Effect Legendary Edition, there is no multiplayer mode, so the only score that exists is total military strength. But still, the game is balanced in such a way that unlocking the best ending still requires tackling pretty much every objective correctly. The War Asset system was supposed to represent how much support Shepard had gained throughout the game, but I think it could have been implemented a lot better. I imagine EA pushed them to make some of these design choices to encourage players to jump into multiplayer mode, where of course EA could sell loot boxes, cosmetics, and the like. I would have preferred an ally system like Dragon Age Origins, where you could actually call on allies to support you in battles during the final mission. That would have been a much more satisfying way to incorporate Shepard's friends than this arbitrary list of resources and some slightly modified cutscenes that we ended up getting in the end. Aside from the ending, one of the biggest controversies of Mass Effect 3 was the Day 1 DLC, From Ashes. Story expansions are a common thing for games like this, but they usually get released many months after the base game is sold. But for Mass Effect 3, EA decided it would be a good idea to strip out one of the main characters and sell him as an added expansion pack available on the same day the game came out. This was an unfortunate choice that led to many players missing out on the Prothean squad mate Javik, a character who I feel is an essential part of this game. Initially Javik was supposed to play a much bigger role in the plot, but his role had to be scaled back so they could package his ass up and sell it as DLC. With the release of Mass Effect Legendary Edition, these things are no longer an issue, since all players will have access to the Eden Prime mission and Javik, but it was a scummy business move at the time. Anyways, during this mission, we returned to Eden Prime after reports that Cerberus recovered a Prothean artifact. This turned out to not be a simple artifact, but a stasis pod containing a living Prothean soldier. After defeating Cerberus troops, we recover the life pod and revive our favorite Trollthian, who goes on to insist we throw anything and everything out the airlock. Throw the machine out of the airlock, Commander. Javik is one of my favorite companions in the trilogy. I enjoy his banter with Liara, his post-mission insights, his visit to the Citadel, and of course his story arc with the Memory Shard. Plus, he's comedic gold during the Citadel DLC. Trollthian no like you! After rescuing Primarch Victus and recruiting Javik, Shepard's next challenge is to gain Krogan support. Before Victus can commit Turian ships to help retake Earth, he asks that Shepard convince the Krogans to help out in the ground war on Palavin. The Krogans won't play ball with us unless we agree to deliver a cure for the Genophage, the sterility plague that was inflicted on them by the Turians and Salarians. Sirkesh has a lot of callbacks to Vermeer in Mass Effect 1. You'll run into Kirahi if he survived Mass Effect 1, and there is some great banter between Rex, Liara, and Garrus if you bring the latter two as squadmates. 
Early in the mission, you'll reconnect with Morden, who is back to his old habits in STG. That to be me. Someone else might have gotten it wrong. At the moment, he's caring for Eve, the only female Krogan to survive Malin's brutal experiments from Mass Effect 2. The game plan quickly goes to hell as Cerberus attacks the facility, leaving Shepard and crew with the task of protecting Eve and Morden while securing the base. This mission is intense and really fun from a combat perspective. In the end, we're able to defeat Cerberus, save Eve, and help keep the Krogans at the bargaining table. Rex, Eve, Morden, and Victus all join us on the Normandy while we prepare to cure the Genophage, which gives us the opportunity to do a few side missions. Grissom Academy is one of those blockbuster side quests of Mass Effect 3. BioWare clearly put a lot of effort into the presentation, level design, and storytelling for some of the side missions in the game, mostly the ones that feature returning squad mates from Mass Effect 2. Shepard and crew land on Grissom Academy to rescue biotic students under siege by Cerberus. You'll meet Anderson's love interest, Kaylee Sanders, and reconnect with the psychotic biotic, Jack, who is now an instructor at the Academy. Players who rescued David Archer during Mass Effect 2's Overlord DLC will also get access to a secret armory, complete with guns. Lots of guns. It's actually just a Matic rifle and a randomized mod, but hey, it's a nice touch. After some difficult fighting against mechs and heavy troopers, we rescue the students before deciding whether they should play a support role or get assigned to frontline combat. After Priority Sirkesh, we'll receive two more major side quests one from Primarch Victus, and the other from Rex. We'll need to complete at least one of these missions in order to unlock the main quest on Tachanka. For this video, I'm just going to cover our quest to find a group of missing Krogan scouts. Rex tells us that there have been rumors of Rachni activity in the Attican Traverse. This is strange for Shepard because the last queen is either in hiding or got incinerated on Novaria, depending on what the commander did in Mass Effect 1. The best part of this mission is it gives us an opportunity to reunite with our son. Shepard? <laughs> Shepard! <laughs> it's good to see you too, big guy. Shepard, Grunt, and all the crew push further into the depths and discover that yes, indeed the Reapers were breeding a Rachni army here. This is one of those moments where Bioware didn't handle player choice very well. If you save the Rachni Queen in Mass Effect 1, then it's all Gucci. But if you torched her instead, then this moment feels like a bad soap opera where the clearly dead villain returns later for no reason. This time stay dead. I don't know. Maybe the Dragon Age team worked on this quest. In the end, you'll have to decide whether or not to save the Rachni Queen again. If it's the real queen and you save her, then you gain a valuable ally. If you save the fake Rachni Queen, then she'll kill off an entire Alliance engineering unit after joining the Crucible Project. And if you abandon either queen, then you save Grunt's squad. This final scene with Grunt is one of my favorite moments in the game. Shuttle's down that path. I'll hold them off. Get out of here, Shepard! Grunt will ultimately survive if you completed his loyalty mission in Mass Effect 2, or if you abandon the Queen. Now on to Tachanka. Curing the Genophage, or curing the Genophage, is one of the most memorable quests in Mass Effect 3. The Krogan sterility plague imposed by the Turians and Salarians is a central point of Mass Effect lore in all three games. So it's fitting that the final game in the trilogy would grant resolution to this major plot point. The plan is to deploy the Genophage Cure through airborne dispersal using the Solarian constructed Shroud facility. Unfortunately, a Reaper has landed on the planet and is stationed near the Shroud, so the team devises a plan to strike at the Reaper with Turian Air Forces and Krogan ground troops to draw it away from the facility. This plan goes FUBAR very early on, so plan B is to lure an ancient Thresher Maw named Kalros near the Reaper to distract it while Shepard and Morden stealth into the Shroud. Bioware really upped the cinematics during this mission, and many shots were used as promotional material in trailers prior to release. Activating the Maw Hammers while the Reaper shoots laser beams at Shepard and drops brutes in your path is one of the most adrenaline-pumping moments of the entire game. After triggering the hammers, Kauros straight up bodies the Reaper, leaving Shepard and Morden to disperse the cure. At this point, the player can decide to let Morden go through with the cure, or sabotage him in an attempt to gain Salarian support. 
This scene can play out in a variety of ways depending on your previous choices. If you decide to sabotage the cure, you'll most likely have to shoot Morden, though he can be convinced to go along with the sabotage if Rex and Eve are both dead. Eve will die shortly before this scene if you destroyed Malin's data in Mass Effect 2. Ultimately, I prefer to cure the Genophage, as it seems like the most fitting end for this quest and Morden's character arc. Seeing how Morden comes to turn with his past misdeeds on the Genophage modification project, and how determined he is to set things right, make this whole scene so impactful. I'll never forget Morden's line when you try to convince him to sabotage the cure. Every time we've talked about this before, you've defended the Genophage. Hell, you destroyed Malin's data. How can you change your mind now? I made a mistake! I made a mistake. Focused on big picture. Big picture made of little pictures. Too many variables. Can't hide behind statistics. Can't ignore new data. My responsibility. Need to go. Running out of time. Celebrating your victory on Tachanka is interrupted by a Cerberus attack on the Citadel. Udina has helped the elusive man's homies take control of the station, and it's up to us to stop him. After clearing off the landing zone and saving Commander Bailey, we fight our way through Cerberus goons and make a push to save the Council. During a tense standoff with Kai Lang, Thane drops in to rescue the Salarian Counselor, but is mortally wounded in the process. At the end of the mission, we have a Wild West showdown with the Vermeer survivor. This is one of the most intense moments of the game, especially on a first playthrough when we don't know how things will shake out. It's also wild how many past decisions come into play during this crucial scene. For instance, did you save the council in Mass Effect 1? Did you romance the Vermeer survivor in Mass Effect 1? If so, did you romance another character in Mass Effect 2? If so, did you lie about it or come clean to the Vermeer survivor in Mass Effect 3? Were you mean to the Vermeer survivor on Mars? Did you talk to the Vermeer survivor in the hospital? Did you talk to Thane in the hospital? Matter of fact, did you recruit Thane in Mass Effect 2, and did he survive the suicide mission? If Thane's gone, did you save Kirihi on Vermeer in Mass Effect 1? If Thane and Kirihi are both gone, then Kai Lang goes rat -ta tat tat on the Salarian Counselor, and Adina makes it look like you did it. I'm sold. All these things impact a hidden trust meter with the Vermeer survivor, and determine whether they will side with Shepard or Udina during this standoff. Ultimately, it's pretty easy to convince them to side with you, so most players won't appreciate the complexity going on behind the scenes. I hope the Reapers send you to hell. Thane's final scene in the hospital is one of the most memorable and emotional moments in the trilogy. He's made peace with his wayward son, as well as his own death, and in his final moments he says a prayer for Commander Shepard. Call yet? There's something I don't understand. His last moments were those of a hero. Why pray for salvation? The prayer was not for him, Commander. He has already asked forgiveness for the lives he has taken. His wish was for you. Goodbye, Thane. You won't be alone long. Woo, it's okay. I'm not crying. After the Cerberus attack, there is a changing of the guard on the Citadel, so to speak. You'll find lots of new NPCs and side quests, including ones involving Bollock, Conrad Werner, and Zaid. This is also a great time to meet up with squad mates for those more personal moments of contemplation. This is when Cortez makes peace with the past, Jack opens up about her new responsibilities, and Joker tells us that f it, he's finally gonna bang that robot. Of course, my favorite moment is when you head up to the top of the Presidium and shoot bottles with the homie Garrus. Do it. I'm Garrus Vicarian, and this is now my favorite spot on the Citadel. Everyone in your squad is coming to grips with the grim reality of the war and recognizing the importance of capitalizing on those YOLO moments. Meanwhile, the general feeling around the Citadel is that people are finally realizing that nowhere in the galaxy is safe and untouched by this war. And more people will start springing into action to contribute to the war effort in any way they can. For now, Shepard has a new task. Get the support of the Corian fleet, who unfortunately have decided that now is the right time to fight a war against the Geth in an attempt to retake their homeworld. This brash move caused many of the Geth to voluntarily ally with the Reapers and receive upgrades to their AI network as a result. 
the Koreans are getting pummeled, and without someone to step in and help, they will surely lose this war. Tally joins us as our final addition to the Mass Effect 3 squad list. Since taking down the Collectors, she's become part of the Corian Admiralty Board, assuming she survived and wasn't exiled during her trial. The first mission involves disabling a Geth Dreadnought that has been destroying the Corian fleet. I don't have much to say about this mission. It's fun to fight through this massive Geth ship, and we get reunited with Legion near the end, who promises to help us in the hopes of stopping the conflict and freeing his people from the Reapers. After disabling the ship's defenses, the Corian Admiral Geralt decides to unleash Hellfire onto the ship while Shepard and crew are still on board. There's only one appropriate response to this move. The Dreadnought was a perfect target. <clears throat> Admiral, you jeopardized your mission and your people. Get the hell off my ship. Before we can disable the Reaper base on Rannoch, we need to complete at least one side mission in this arc, just like with Tachanka. The Koreans ask us to rescue Admiral Quib Quib, commander of the civilian fleet, and the only anti-war voice on the board. It's interesting to see his role flip from Mass Effect 2. During Tally's treason trial, he was the one who wanted to see her convicted and exiled. But in Mass Effect 3, if you save him, he becomes a crucial ally in the fight for peace. The other side mission is given to us by Legion, and it's one of the wilder missions in the game. Shepard must interface with a Geth server and deactivate some fighter squadrons that have been harassing the Corians. This mission doesn't have any combat, just some light puzzle solving and a lot of lore on the history of the Geth. We learn that the Corians first tried to destroy the Geth when one of them asked their creator if they had a soul. We could actually get this dialogue with Legion in Mass Effect 2, but he's added so late in the game that many players probably missed it, so I'm glad they included it again here in 3. Can you replay something for me? Recording timestamp from creator year 2485, 18th day of Loonshaw, new moon. Mistress Hala Dama, unit has an inquiry. What is it, 431? Do these units have a soul? Who taught you that word? We learned it ourselves. It appears 216 times in the scroll of ancestors. Only Quarians have souls. It's also heavily implied that Legion was the first Geth to fight back against the Quarians, which Legion is pretty coy about. That looks a lot like the sniper rifle you used to carry. It is an efficient model. Once Shepard's work is complete, Legion covertly transfers the Geth intelligence into a group of Prime units. Shepard is disturbed by Legion's duplicitous move, but ultimately accepts their help. Now the only thing left to do is retake Rannoch. Priority Rannoch is peak Mass Effect, the best example of multi-game player choice and consequence on display in a fantastic mission with great gameplay and dramatic writing. Whether or not you can secure peace between the Geth and Corians is determined by a variety of decisions you made in Mass Effect 2 and 3. I have an entire guide on how to pull this off, but here are the broad factors. Did you complete Tally's loyalty mission, retain her loyalty, and avoid her exile? Did you complete Legion's loyalty mission, and did you destroy or rewrite the Geth heretics? Did Tally and Legion both survive the suicide mission? Did you save Admiral Chorus? Did you disable the Geth fighter squadrons? And finally, how high is Shepard's reputation score in Mass Effect 3? There is some small margin of error here, but if you make enough correct choices, then it will unlock a third option for peace during the end of the mission. But I'm getting ahead of myself. You have a great moment with Tally at the beginning of the mission as she fantasizes about building a home on Rannoch. And then you dive into some of the best combat sections of the game. I love fighting through the Geth base, especially getting a hold of a Spitfire heavy weapon and taking out some primes at the end. Once Shepard paints the base with a targeting laser, the squad realizes that it's not just a Reaper base, it's an actual Reaper. They make a mad escape, and then Shepard fights the thing solo on foot. This boss fight is gimmicky, but always stresses me the f*** out. It ultimately works well for what it is. The final scene of this mission is hands down one of the best in the game. After the Reaper is defeated, the Geth are freed from its control and they cease their attack on the Corians. In this moment, Admiral Garrel seizes the opportunity to launch a counterattack in the hopes of wiping out the Geth permanently. The stakes are incredibly high in this scene as Tally and Legion both plead with Shepard to save their own people. 
Our fleet is already attacking. Uploading the code would destroy us. Shepard, you can't choose the Geth over my people. Do you remember the question that caused the creators to attack us, Talizora? Does this unit have a soul? If you allow Legion to fully complete the upload, the Corians are wiped out in a blaze of unglory, and Tally jumps off a cliff. If you side with the Corians, Legion attacks Shepard, causing Tally to prison shank him. But if you did everything right, you will unlock an option to secure peace with a Paragon or Renegade speech check. Shepard, Tally, and Quib Quib all chime in on Corian comms and convince Admiral Garrel to halt his attack, leading to a ceasefire and an uneasy peace between the Geth and Corians. It's an incredibly feel-good moment. The Geth don't want to fight you. If you can believe that for just one minute, this war will be over. You have a choice. Please, kill us alive. All units, hold fire. Error. Copying code is insufficient. Direct personality dissemination required. Shepard Commander, I must go to them. I'm... I'm sorry. It's the only way. Legion, the answer to your question was yes. I know, Tally. But thank you. Kill us a line. Priority Rannoch is the high point in the war for Shepard and our allies. The scales start sliding in the favor of the Reapers after this, and everything becomes more desperate as the game progresses. Also, the quality of the writing starts to slide downhill from here as well. There are some great moments in the latter portions of the game, but nothing quite as good as Rannoch. I guess now is as good a time as any to talk about the Omega and Leviathan DLCs. BioWare released three story expansions for Mass Effect 3. I'll touch on the Citadel DLC at the end of this video because I usually save it for last in my playthroughs, and it was the true final goodbye for the original Mass Effect trilogy. I usually like to play Omega and Leviathan somewhere in the middle of the game. Omega sees us linking up with Arya Talok to retake Omega Station from Cerberus. This was originally slated to be a mission in the base game, but it was eventually cut and reworked as an expansion. Honestly, I think it works better this way for a few reasons. One, it allows us to use Arya as a squad mate and spend more time with her. More screen time for Arya is always a good thing since she's a phenomenal character. If Omega was crammed into the base game, it would have been a much shorter mission, and we most likely wouldn't have had Arya as an actual squad mate. Two, Omega feels like a major detour. Sure, Arya has some powerful mercenaries at her disposal, but that's nothing on the scale of the Turian fleet, the Krogan armies, the Corians and the Geth, the Asari, etc. So it was harder to integrate the Omega mission into the overall narrative because it feels like a lower priority task than the other main missions that Shepard had to work on during the story. Anyhow, overall the Omega DLC is pretty great. Your choices can have an impact on Arya's morality and affect the ending of the DLC, which I think is awesome too. The Leviathan DLC provides the missing link for the main story. That is, the origin and motivation of the Reapers. I don't really have a whole lot to say about Leviathan, it's fun to play through, but mostly its value is in the lore. Now on to some side missions before Thessia. There's a mission where you rescue Jacob. You also receive a mission from Liara to investigate an Ardot Yakshi monastery. This mission introduces the Banshee enemy type, the twisted, reaperfied Asari created from the Ardot Yakshi. This kind of messes with the lore a little bit. In Mass Effect 2, Samara said that as far as she knew, there were only three Ardot Yakshi still in existence, Morinth and Samara's other two daughters. Yet this monastery facility is massive, and it's clear there were others living here. Also, we fight probably at least a dozen banshees in the game between this mission, Thessia, and Earth. So perhaps Samara didn't have her facts straight on the number of Ardot Yakshi. In any case, I like the lore of the banshees, and they are a terrifying enemy type that can teleport and one-shot you with their grab attacks. So if Bioware had to bend the lore a little bit to fit them into the game, I'm completely okay with that. Priority Thessia is a major turning point in Mass Effect 3's storyline. 
Up until this point, Shepard and crew had consistently been racking up victory after victory against Cerberus and the Reapers. That all changed on Thessia, the Asari homeworld, now completely overrun by Reaper forces. Shepard needs to land on Thessia and recover an ancient Prothean artifact that could be the key to completing the Crucible. Liara is a mandatory squad mate for this mission, and I highly recommend bringing Javik along as well, since he has a ton of unique dialogue. After reaching the Asari Temple, Shepard uncovers a Prothean beacon, which houses a VI with vital data on the Crucible project. But before the team can recover it, everyone's favorite rat tail samurai swoops in to steal it. After chatting with the elusive man, Shepard fights Kai Lang, winning the battle but losing in the cutscene. The mood back on the Normandy is incredibly somber, and the defeat clearly takes a toll on Shepard. This is the first time since Udina grounded the Normandy before Ilos in Mass Effect 1, where the commander seems truly crushed. At this point, it seems like the war could be totally lost, and we just watched the most advanced civilization in the galaxy get floor wiped by the Reapers. Tensions are high. Shepard has a major blowout fight with Joker after he makes a quip about the Asari, and Joker reveals that he's lost contact with his dad and sister, who both live on a small colony that's since been overtaken by the Reapers. If you think Shepard is in bad shape, Liara is far worse, having just watched her homeworld get completely decimated. I've seen a lot of criticism for Liara's quote-unquote childish behavior during these post-mission scenes, particularly during her bitter fight with Javik. But I don't know, that seems a little unfair to me. For this entire game, the Asari homeworld has been untouched by war, so Liara has been disconnected from it up until this point. While she shows sympathy for Palavin and Earth, the war really just hits different when it's your own home that is burning. So I think her emotional breakdown is pretty understandable given the circumstances. Like Shepard, she also feels a lot of personal responsibility for what happened on Thessia, like she could have done something to stop the attack or defeat the Reapers. I always get a little emotional when Shepard and Liara have this conversation. How did this happen, Shepard? My entire civilization. The Asari's history. The Protheans made it a lie all along. And I abandoned my people to hunt for the Catalyst. Liara, you had nothing to do with the attack on Thessia. Nothing to do with it? I told those people on Thessia we'd save them. How many Asari died because I demanded their help? None. Shepard, that isn't true. You've been warning your people for four years, Liara. There's not a damn thing you should feel guilty about. In the end, she eventually comes around and dives back into her work. Anyhow, on to Sanctuary. Thanks to Trainer, Shepard and crew are able to track Kai Lang to Horizon, the colony world that Shepard defended from a collector attack in Mass Effect 2. Horizon has been since dubbed Sanctuary, a supposed safe haven for war refugees. In reality, Sanctuary was a trap. Cerberus lured unsuspecting refugees and used them as test subjects in a project run by Miranda's father, Henry Lawson. The goal was to develop technology that would allow the elusive man to seize control of the Reapers. Miranda is here on Sanctuary as well, having tracked her father down. He kidnapped her sister, by the way. At the end of the mission, we find Miranda in an armed standoff with her papa, and he's using her sister as a human shield. What, you've never played the classic family game, Protect Papa from the Spectre before? No? <laughs> Whether Miranda lives or dies during this scene is based upon the choices you made. If you failed to read Kai Lang's dossier, Shepard won't warn Miranda during the hologram conversation. Also, if you deny Miranda access to Alliance resources, or skip any of the conversations with her, or break up with her if you were in a romance in Mass Effect 2, any of these actions will cause Miranda to die from Kai Lang's attack. But even if you get all of that right, you still need to convince Henry Lawson to put down his gun, or kneecap Oriana with a renegade interrupt, to give Miranda an opportunity to strike. A frequent criticism I hear about Mass Effect 3 is that your choices don't matter, and that's honestly never sat right with me. Your choices mattered on Tachanka, and on the Citadel, and on Rannoch as well, and they matter with Miranda here too. What did people expect from this game? That every little decision you ever made in the trilogy would lead to a completely different set of quests? How many games do that at all? Maybe The Witcher 2, but that's a relatively self-contained game, 
and it's pretty messy in how it executed those story differences at times. More than that, how many games even bother to track decisions players made in previous titles, much less two previous entries in the series? I'm just not sure I understand the whole trope of quote-unquote your choices don't matter when it comes to Mass Effect 3. There are plenty of places where your decisions lead to different outcomes. Anyhow, let's move on to the next mission. After the encounter on Sanctuary, Shepard is able to locate Cerberus' home base thanks to a well-placed tracker by Miranda. Launching the assault on Kronos Station effectively pushes you towards the final mission, since afterwards you will be locked out of all side content and map locations except for Earth. I have very mixed feelings about Kronos Station. From a gameplay standpoint, it's a really fun mission, and I feel like a complete badass tearing through Cerberus' home base. It also has some great video log lore dumps on Project Lazarus, the creation of Edie, Kai Lang, and the Elusive Man's indoctrination. But other aspects of the mission feel unpolished. Cerberus was able to recover remains of the Human Reaper, even if you destroyed the Collector base in Mass Effect 2, which really doesn't make a lot of sense. It's one of those decisions that ultimately feels meaningless and lends weight to the argument that your choices don't matter in Mass Effect 3. Bioware could have handled the Collector base decision much better. If you gave the base to Cerberus, maybe you would have fought a rebooted Human Reaper in Chrono Station. Or if a boss fight was too resource intensive to design, at least make the Kai Lang fight harder if they got the base. The only difference in the game as it stands is a measly 10 point differential in war assets. 110 points if you gave the base to Cerberus, 100 points if you destroyed it. Oh, and a few lines of dialogue. That's literally it. I guess it also affects the ending choice if you have extremely low war assets but most players will never see that unless they're intentionally messing everything up like a pink goggles shepherd. Anyhow, you make it to the heart of the station, talk to the elusive man, and finally defeat Kai Lang. I love the renegade interrupt as well, where Shepard shatters his shitty little sword. That was for fame, you son of a bitch. Here's where things go a little wild. In just a few lines of dialogue with the Prothean VI that we recovered, we learn that the elusive man snitched on the Crucible Project, the Citadel is the Catalyst, the Reapers captured the Citadel, and they moved it to Earth. Like, what? Everything feels so abrupt, and Bioware violates the storytelling principle of show, don't tell in a major way here. The whole thing just feels rushed, and I wonder if Bioware's short development time had an impact on how this was written. In any case, after Chrono Station, we have no choice but to launch our final assault on Earth. Luckily, the Crucible is complete, and our fleet is assembled. Priority Earth, the final mission of Mass Effect 3, is a mixed bag to say the least. There are some phenomenal moments and great gameplay, but also some god-awful moments as well. Let's take it from the top. For starters, Hackett's speech, amazing. The opening cutscenes where you see all the allies you've assembled, amazing. The dialogue bug that makes Shepard yell, STEVE! Amazing. Priority Earth opens up strong and there are some cool moments along the way, but something feels missing from this mission. The environment and level design of the map is very bland and generic. There isn't much in the design that screams, hey, this is London, aside from a view of Big Ben and some random red telephone booths. The rest is just grey rubble and generic looking buildings. The combat encounters feel very generic as well, aside from the opening where you take out the Hades cannon and near the end when you take down a reaper. The whole mission just feels very bare bones from a gameplay design perspective. On the other hand, the character writing is solid and you have some incredible final conversations with roughly 20 different characters. My favorites are Shepard's final chats with Garrus, Javik, Rex, and Liara. The final combat section of the mission is intense. You have to defend an Alliance heavy artillery ground unit while Edie calibrates the targeting system. This will allow Shepard to fire the missiles and take out a Reaper destroyer that is defending the Citadel beam. Bioware throws everything and the kitchen sink at the player here. Banshees, Brutes, a Harvester, and a whole bunch of other Reaper forces. Nonetheless, while this encounter is difficult, it lacks the pizzazz of a final boss fight. After taking down the Reaper, Shepard and crew have to make a mad dash on foot towards the Citadel beam. 
This moment is intense as Harbinger lands in the background and begins firing laser beams as you run for your life. Before you reach the beam, Harbinger's laser blast topples a Mako and injures one of your squad mates. Shepard phones the Normandy for an evac and you send your crew packing. This was a retcon added in during the extended cut DLC. The only purpose it serves is to explain how your squad mates ended up back on the ship for the final cutscene on the unnamed planet where the Normandy crashes. This part is jarring and breaks the flow of the final push to the beam, but at least Bioware wrote some damn good final goodbyes for the crew. They are really capable of pulling out all the stops when they need a dramatic cutscene. I can't stay behind. Don't argue with me, Tally. Don't leave me behind. I need you to make it out of here alive, Tally. Get back to Rannick. Build yourself a home. Come back to me. After the Normandy leaves, Shepard is hit with a laser beam from Harbinger, and here's where things start to get a little freaky. The fan-created indoctrination theory claims that everything that happens after Shepard is hit with the beam is only happening within Shepard's mind. I made a whole video investigating indoctrination theory, so I won't rehash it here. Check out that video if you want a deep dive on the theory. Bioware has dismissed indoctrination theory, so for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to set it aside. Shepard is badly injured by Harbinger but manages to pull himself up, his armor charred from the laser blast. He stumbles towards the beam, takes out a few husks as well as Marauder shields, and manages to make it inside the Citadel. Anderson was also able to make it onto the Citadel, and the two of them chat over comms before linking up in the command center. Before Anderson can open the station's arms, the Elusive Man makes a dramatic entrance. This is the first and only time we speak to the Elusive Man in person in the entire trilogy. This whole conversation is phenomenal in my opinion. Anderson is like the angel on your shoulder while the Elusive Man is the devil trying to convince you to go along with his plan to control the Reapers. But as the dialogue goes on, it's clear that he's been indoctrinated and there's no way he can put his plan into motion. Listen to yourself. You're indoctrinated. No, no. The two of you so self-righteous. Do you think power like this comes easy? There are sacrifices. You've sacrificed too much. In the last ditch effort, he pulls a gun on Anderson and Shepard has to pull a renegade interrupt to stop him. There's also a potential option to convince the elusive man to shoot himself, reminiscent of the end of Saren in Mass Effect 1. With the Elusive Man out of the way, Anderson and Shepard share a peaceful moment together as the Citadel arms open up for the Crucible. Man, this scene gets me every time. God. Feels like years since I just... sat down. I think you earned a rest. Anderson? Mm. Mm. Stay with me. We're almost through this. You did good, son. You did good. I'm proud of you. Thank you, sir. Anderson? Everything up until this point has been pretty good or even great, but things take a wrong turn when Shepard gets beamed up to meet the Catalyst. This is the Catalyst, the rogue AI that controls the Reapers, and directs them to harvest advanced organic life. We see it in the form of the young boy that Shepard failed to save back in Vancouver. The same boy that has been haunting the commander in those terrible dream sequences. To say that this part of the game feels like it came from out of left field is an understatement. It's jarring to go from the elusive man and docking the crucible to chatting with the star child. Shepard and the Catalyst talk for roughly 15 minutes as it explains the Reaper's motivations and why its solution will no longer work for the galaxy. It goes on to outline up to three potential solutions that Shepard can choose from at the end. First is Destroy. Shepard can detonate the Crucible, which will wipe out the Reapers. Unfortunately, the Blast will also wipe out all advanced synthetic life, including the Geth, Edie, and even Shepard because of his cybernetic implants. The second choice is Control. Shepard can upload himself as a construct, a la Johnny Silverhand, 
become the catalyst and seize control of the Reapers, realizing the elusive man's dreams. Shepard's physical form will die, but he'll live on as an artificial intelligence. Finally, Shepard can add his power to the Crucible to merge all synthetic and organic life using space magic. Shepard will die in the process, but this will end the war and create a strange utopia. It's pretty clear that Bioware was steering us towards synthesis as the quote-unquote best ending. It requires the most war assets to unlock, it saves Edie and the Geth, and the extended cut narration makes it seem like a goddamn wonderland. I can't get over the creepy green glowing eyes though. Synthesis just feels wrong to me. You can also refuse these choices by rejecting them in dialogue or shooting at the Star Child, in which case you get a brief cutscene that shows the Reapers won the war and continued the cycle of extinction. Ultimately, all of these endings require some kind of sacrifice, usually Shepard's life. In this framework, there is no way to defeat the Reapers without getting a tragic ending. After playing through three games and building up this character of Shepard, I don't think any of us wanted to watch the commander become a martyr. We wanted a more triumphant ending like we got in Mass Effect 1 and 2. While these endings do present radically different futures for the galaxy, unfortunately this was not represented well in the cutscenes. Bioware got clowned on a lot for the red, green, and blue filters they put over almost identical sequences of cutscenes for each of the quote-unquote different endings. After receiving a ton of fan backlash over the endings, Bioware had developed and released the extended cut as a free update in the summer of 2012. The extended cut didn't change any of the endings, but it did flesh things out more with additional cutscenes and end slides, which spelled out some more of the differences in these endings. While some fans were satisfied with the extended cut update, it was a classic case of too little too late. Most players who played the game at launch had already moved on by the time the update was released, and the general sentiment and memes around the red, green, and blue endings have persisted even to this day over a decade later. Unfortunately, the poorly executed ending of Mass Effect 3 is the legacy of this game, and it's a damn shame because it outshines all of the great moments that ME3 has to offer. But we still got one more thing to talk about, the final DLC of Mass Effect 3. I usually save the Citadel DLC for the end of my Mass Effect 3 playthroughs. To me, this represents the true end to the Mass Effect trilogy, not Priority Earth. Bioware released this expansion as a love letter to fans and a wholesome send-off to all our favorite characters. The DLC is fan service at its finest, giving us lots of hilarious moments with our crew, including a phenomenal party that Shepard throws in his swanky new Citadel apartment, courtesy of Anderson. The Shepard clone plotline is hilarious, and Bioware really leans in to some of the best memes and inside jokes from the series. Now if you'll excuse me, the Normandy needs its captain. So, I should go. He said, I should go. Do I sound like that? As long as I've known you, yeah. Shouldn't we be worrying about the impregnable vault we've been sealed inside forever? How come nobody told me this before? I'm open to feedback here. Well, I thought all humans said it, like some weird Earth custom or something. There's probably not much air in here either. For the three of us, maybe an hour, if we take shallow breaths. Maybe it's, I should go. I should go. I should go. After the clone has been defeated, Joker suggests that the commander throw a party for everyone. At this point, you can meet up with each squad mate and crew member individually, and these are some of my favorite moments of the game. Of course, the party is phenomenal as well, and it's awesome to see all of our favorite characters together in one place. Well, most of our favorite characters anyway. Morden, Legion, Thane, and Dr. Chakwas don't appear directly in the DLC due to story reasons or voice actor conflicts. I could go on and on about Citadel, and I'll probably make a separate video on it at some point, but suffice it to say, it injects some much-needed levity into the game after that terrible ending we got. To me, the final scene of the DLC where everyone comes together in the docking bay outside the Normandy is the true ending for the series. <sighs> We've had a good ride. <laughs> the best. So now that a decade has gone by, 
what is the legacy of Mass Effect 3? Unfortunately, all of the great parts of this game are most often overshadowed by the ending. Mass Effect 3 cannot escape the shadow of the Star Child and the Red, Green, Blue memes. Just like a bad game launch can ruin a game's reputation, <coughs> cyberpunk, so can a poorly written ending, especially for the conclusion to a trilogy. For me, Mass Effect 3 is the most ambitious experiment in player choice and consequence. But while its ambitions were high, it failed to achieve its ultimate goals. Like Icarus, Bioware flew too close to the sun with its game and ended up crashing to the ground. I'm sure the studio would have liked to have created even more branching paths based on player choices and further fleshed out their vision for the endings, but time and budget constraints got in the way. But when you look past the last 15 minutes of the game and take a deeper look at the character writing, alternate story outcomes based on different choices, and improvements to combat and gameplay, there is a lot to love in Mass Effect 3. It is a truly incredible game in many respects, and it's still my favorite Mass Effect game. The real shame, though, is that it could have been a masterpiece. Thank you all for watching. If you made it this far into the video, I commend you. This video took a lot longer to make than I initially anticipated. Turns out I had a lot to say about this game. Go figure. I don't make a lot of these longer form retrospectives, but if you enjoyed it, let me know in the comments if you want to see something more like this, or potentially what other games you want to see me cover. I hope to get back to more frequent uploads now that this project is done and dusted. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to Big Dan Gaming for more Mass Effect and RPG videos. I also have a bunch more Mass Effect videos, so why don't you check out another one, like this one I've linked on the screen. And as always, shout out to all the channel members for supporting my content. Until next time, this has been Big Dan. I should go.